Roy Hodgson has been involved in the world of football for over 60 years. He has won major honours in multiple countries and managed at the highest level. And today, he's agreed to meet me for a spot of tea. Hello. Hey. Table for two? Please follow me. Thank you. Here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we'll get your coffee in before we start. It's good. Well. Roy, lovely to see you. Thank As you. always, um, I have a present for you. I hope you like this because it took a really long time to make. <laughs> This is, this is a book of just some of your achievements in football and uh, we thought we'd go through it with you. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. It also, we had to get a bigger table because this came out a lot bigger than we expected. Yeah. But here we go. So, what we wanted to do, because there will be a number of younger football fans, Roy, that will not realise that you actually were this person, bottom, far right, playing football. You started your career in 1965. That must seem like an eternity away. Yes, it does. I mean, I've, I've forgotten most of it, I must <laughs> say. I, I probably couldn't name all of those players in the, in the picture, though I could name some, of course. But uh, it was an interesting time, of course, having left Palace and playing non-league football there at, at Gravesend and Northfleet. They're now calling themselves Ebbsfleet United, I believe. So the, the club doesn't exist anymore. But no, it was a... It was what I was hoping would continue into a, a better football career than I eventually had. What it did lead you into was a brilliant managerial career. We want to talk about Roy the coach. I absolutely love this photo of you. I, I, your hair is excellent, your outfit's excellent, a couple of goalkeepers here. What was this time like and where was this? Well, it's at Harmstead. That's the club that I, I went to in 1976, um, January. I mean, that's a strange coaching photo in a way because I'm coaching the goalkeepers. But it, it did show one thing, I suppose, that, you know, it was a, a club which trained four nights a week, played on Sundays. Uh, there was no coaching staff to speak of. I mean, I was the coaching staff, I had an assistant, but nothing like the coaching staffs that you know today. No goalkeeper coach, of course, as you can see there, because this is me trying to put what little goalkeeping skills or coaching skills in goalkeeping I had into practice with the, the, the two young boys there, who neither of whom actually was the first team goalkeeper coach. So. Is that why they look thoroughly unimpressed? <laughs> Probably, yeah. Well, well, I hope I'm showing them that that's not the way to do it because my arms are too wide, so I guess that's what I'm trying to say to them. You've got to tuck your elbows in. But don't, don't do this. <laughs> yeah, don't do this, yeah. Let's move on to the next one. Here we go. Sweden, a really successful time for you. Tell me why you felt it was so successful over there, why it fit, why your coaching style and what you had to bring to Sweden was so impressive. The good fortune was the way we'd been coached, if you like, and the coaching that we thought we were good at doing was actually based on a, a British style of football. You know, not so dissimilar to what we're seeing today. I mean, it was based on a, a very, very high line defensively, very high pressing, but we were playing against teams that were playing a German style of football which was man-to-man. -man. So we, we cleaned up really tactically for years. It took them a long while to work it out that perhaps we'd better do something different ourselves. <laughs> and it was the emergence of Sven and Eriksson and Todd Greep really that uh, brought everything back into line. So we only benefited from that for maybe the first four to five years. By the time I got to Malmö in 85, teams had wised up. So it was a, it was a different kettle of fish. Right, let's move on then. My arm, wow, this book is also heavy. <laughs> so let me just make sure I've got this. This is more success in Sweden, but what we'll do is, because you've sort of mentioned it, yeah, yeah. we will we'll move past that one. Yeah. And here we go. We'll start to talk about Switzerland. So it's yeah. becoming pretty clear that you weren't afraid to take on a new challenge in a different country. Why was that important to you? Well, I think one of the things that kept us in Sweden so long was our, our, our son's education. I mean, he's, he was... A, educated in, in Sweden. We didn't really, one or two opportunities had come to leave a bit earlier, but we really wanted to try and get him past that 18 year mark where he would finish all his exams in, in Sweden. And when that actually happened, and to be fair, we had five fantastic years at, at uh, Malmö and won the, won the league every year in, in a team that was becoming a little bit of a self-playing piano, you know, the 
it wasn't that difficult. If you've got the best players in the country, it's easy to win titles. Uh, and then this offer ch came to go to Neuchatel Zamax and that then led to the national team. Luckily, in that first period, 92 to 94, to qualify for the World Cup, only one player or two players were playing outside of Switzerland. And you could, uh, could say that was an advantage because it gave me a chance to really see them and get to know them. Uh, we even had a couple of periods where we could bring the players in outside of the international breaks just to work with them for a couple of days, get to know them a bit better. So we actually forged something of a club side in those two years. The next two years, from 94 to 96, in the qualification for the Euros, that became a bit more complicated because we'd had success and as happens with success some of the players got, got spotted and taken to clubs out in, in other countries in Europe. I love this picture so much. Um, this is one of the, I mean you look really cool in that picture and Paul Lintz as well and I was looking through the, the list of names it's quite easy I think to forget some of these names of these superstars that you managed. I'm going to pass this page as well because it into you all, I mean look Ronaldo the original Ronaldo as well. I'm going to list some of these names out um, for people at home that are watching. Roberto Baggio, uh, Roberto Carlos, Diego Simeone. It, I mean, Jorkev, there's some incredible names of, of players that you manage. Not always easy, I imagine. Well, well, how would you describe your, your time at Inter, both times at Inter? Well, funny enough, that was a time which I really regard as a, a temporary period at Inter. Um, they got into some difficulties in, in that particular season. I'd, I'd left after two seasons and those two seasons went quite well. There was no Ronaldo and mm -hmm. Paul was there though, so that first picture is there with when Paul was there. But this one when I came back was uh, a brief spell where it was a really stellar inter-team that had been put together with some of the biggest stars. You've mentioned three or four, but there were more, you know, there was Andrea Pirlo, there was Paolo Sosa, there was Adam Winter, there was Zamorano, you know, the, the list went on on Diego Simeone, the list went on and on. Well, Ronnie was just actually one of them. Um, and that was a difficult time. I don't think I handled it very well, to be perfectly honest. Uh, there was a lot of problems within the dressing room, partly because of Ronaldo had his group and Diego Simeone had his group. And I certainly didn't manage that well. You talk about, you know, your diplomatic and empathetic skills. They didn't seem to be too much in evidence there. That's quite a nice picture, that, because most of the time I never got the feeling that Ronaldo had much time for me, and I certainly was often quite angry with, with him for certain aspects of his behaviour. So it's quite nice to know we must have had a few moments when we got on quite well together. He had a bad knee injury, and he had to stop playing, and that didn't help because then he was on the sidelines. And Lippi was scheduled to come. He'd, he'd left Juventus in... January, I think, but he wouldn't come for this short period when they were doing badly. So Muggins got brought back in to try and hold the fort a little bit. I probably wanted to do too much to, well, I'm going to come in now and I'm going to change all this around, whereas it was an impossible task. I should have come in and made certain that things were a bit calmer than they were. I, I poured oil on the waters rather than calming them. So some 21 years after leaving England, you are back and you're back here and you go to Blackburn and you've got a Manager of the Month award here that you're holding up. And what was your time like at Blackburn? What was it like coming back to England as well? Yeah, it was quite good really. I mean, I didn't quite know what to expect, but I found a, a group of players when I came back who actually, uh, it was a good group, there were some good players, but they were also very interested in, you know, some of the methods that I brought with me from Italy and some of the, some of the sort of aspects of the coaching that I tried to do. I think that went down went down well and we became a very well organised team and, and did very well. I think we finished, you know, we, well we got into Europe anyway, I don't remember exactly what number, but we, we had quite a good season. Uh, unfortunately it also was a, the place that taught me a lesson because the next year in January we were in the relegation zone I think, in, in December sorry, we were in the relegation zone. A lot of games still to play but the owner, Jack Walker, who was a good guy, that did a wonderful thing for Blackburn Rovers, I think he was in ill health and I think he was worried that his club was going to go out of the Premier League 
and he, he made that decision, which you know owners do, to, to change the, the coach. And I don't think I'd behaved as well as I should have done. I think I was quite arrogant after the first year. I probably should have dealt with things differently. I don't think my leadership skills were that good when I was at Blackburn. So to some extent, I provoked it. I, I was a, an author, if you like, of that downfall. To some extent, I never really got over leaving Inter. That was part of it as well. You know, I, I thought I needed to leave Inter. I thought that's what Massimo Moratti really wanted, although he said not. He said he wanted me to stay on, but I never thought that he really did. I think he thought that two years was enough, you know, let's get somebody else in. So when Blackburn came along, it seemed like a good exit strategy and a, another interesting period of my career. But it wasn't because I was desperate to get back to England. And of course, you know, when you've been at Inter and you've been at Milan, Blackburn, however good a club it was at that time, it doesn't really compare to, to Inter. So I didn't do myself any favour. So I don't, I don't blame Jack for getting rid of me. Um, and in fact, he probably did me a service in a way because, you know, if I was going to carry on for another 26 or 27 years afterwards, probably, I remember Dave Sexton, the man I much admire, ringing me up and uh, to commiserate, but one of the first thing he said, well, you can really call yourself a coach and manager now because you've been sacked. Up to now, <laughs> you, you know, you've just been playing at it. What did it feel like? I, d I hope that's not a silly question, oh, but... Oh, bad. I mean, bad. I mean, I, I mean, having that period of success which I'd had first in Sweden, then in Switzerland, and even to Italy, it wasn't particularly unsuccessful. It, it unfortunately divorces you sometimes from the reality, and I don't think it brings out always your best qualities. I think sometimes your best qualities are brought out in, 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 in times of difficulty, not in, in times of relative ease. So I think it was a, a wake-up call to me and a reminder that, listen, You've had a wonderful spell up to now, but if you want to keep it going, you better analyse a little bit yourself and remember the good things about the way you work and the way you are, which has perhaps brought you to this point, and be careful to rein in one or two of the things which might, in fact, tip you over in the wrong direction. It led to more globetrotting after this. Um, lots of, of different photos that we could have put in here. Tell me about what's happening here, though. Well, that's the, that's the time, I think, when FC Copenhagen, they were a relatively young club. They'd, they'd been in existence for six or seven years. They'd reached a, a cup final, but they'd not won anything. But we did play at the national stadium. We did have very big crowds. You know, we used to play in front of 25 to 40,000 people. The club had ambitions and we won the league. And that, that was a very big moment for FC Copenhagen. How many languages do you speak? <laughs> you count English, is English okay to count one, <laughs> I suppose? I learned French at school, but it was really only honed when I went to Switzerland. I, I, I really learned French then because I'd never used it. Mm -hmm. Both with Neuchâtel Zamax for French and with Inter for Italian, it was necessary. Mm -hmm. Sweden was never necessary. You know, from about six years on, every Swede speaks English, so yeah. there was a lot of players I worked with in Sweden who spoke better English than I did. They want you to speak English to them as well to yeah, perfect they quite their skills if they it, haven't yeah. perfected they quite it. Liked it yeah. So what, what's that for? Uh, well, I do speak a bit of German, that was from the Swiss national team as well, yeah. Amazing. So too many to count. Uh, I want to talk to you about Fulham, your time at Fulham. Here we go, 2007 to 2010. 2010 Europa League final as well, but yeah. was perhaps one of your Greatest achievements at Fulham, keeping them up that first season? Yeah, it was. I mean, it was a really good team, really good club. Um, it was a second European final. I'd lost a European Cup final with Inter. That was tough because that was two, leg, two legs as well. And we lost the second leg on penalties at home. So that was even tougher than this one. This was, this was right near the end of extra time against Atletico Madrid in a one leg final. So it was, it was a, a, a tough moment, and I suppose I can see that etched on my face a little bit there. I don't exactly look that I'm enjoying the achievement of reaching the final, but it was an achievement, and that group of players deserve enormous credit for what they did. OK, let's move on. OK, where are we now? So this is the now old Melwood, isn't it? Yep. O old Liverpool training ground where the houses, you could look into the training ground. Did you like that? What, what was it like? 
on that training ground. Yeah, I used to love this place. Yeah, I mean, listen, Liverpool's a, a fantastic football club. I mean, it, I mean, it was a, it's a real honour, if you like, to be invited to be the manager of Liverpool. I didn't probably get invited to be manager of the club at the, the best possible time because of the ownership change. And of course, the problem was we started badly. We didn't win enough games. And as a result, you know, for Liverpool, we were down mid-table, even below mid-table. And unfortunately, you don't survive that, uh, especially when Kenny was in the, in the wings ready to take over. That's something you can't do as a football manager. You can't lose games. Right, next one. Here we go, West Brom, 2011 to 2012. Smile on your face for this one. Tell me what's happening here. <laughs> Yeah, well, we, we did well at West Brom, to be fair. I, I, I was very doubtful about going there. It was very soon after Liverpool that they asked me to come, and I was. The, my first reaction was, I don't think so. But then Dan Ashworth was very persistent. He, he, he didn't take no for an answer. He left it a week or two, and then he got back again. Look, you know, we think this would be a good job for you, and you would help us out. And I'm glad he did, because I went there, found a fantastic group of people. Good club as well, a really, really good club, and we did well enough in the first year to do it, then do particularly well in the second year, and that provoked, of course, the interest from from England because I'm not certain that interest would have come directly after being sacked at Liverpool. Speaking of England, there you go, 2012, Roy is appointed England manager. What was it? Four years you spent as England boss? Four years, yeah. Yeah. Tell me about the highs, tell me about the lows, and and what you learnt from this experience. Well, the highest was certainly being appointed. I mean, it's every, you know, it should be every English manager or coach's dream to be appointed manager of his national team. So it was an incredible honour, and that, that will always remain right at the very, very top, if you like, of honours that have come my way and achievements. And that was actually uh, a team that Capello had put together. I made very little changes. This was the 2012 penalty shootout, wasn't it, against yes. Italy? Yeah. What was it like being in penalties with England? Well, of course, the one thing you did, you took, you took with it, to some extent, some of the uh, media mm. complaints uh, uh, about what had happened in the past. So before we even got to that, mm. in that, well, what if it goes to penalties? You know, we do badly at penalties. We lost here on penalties. We're not good at. Are you practicing penalties? So it was almost drummed into us to some extent that well, if it goes to penalties, you're in trouble. Uh, so I don't think the confidence was high uh, because you know these guys listen to the media. They listen to what's being said, and we we half thought, oh blimey, we're at penalties now. Is it going to go the way they tell us it always goes? Mm -hmm. And it did. I get irritated by people suggesting, well, they didn't concentrate, they didn't take it serious enough, they didn't practice. Of course you do. And we did practice, but we missed and we went out. Was the pressure of, of, of being England manager the most you've ever felt? Yeah. Yes, of course. I mean, because you're representing a nation. You're representing a nation where football is the, is the major interest and it, it is not only the number one game it's so far and away the number one game we've got a lot of other good sports that we're very good at but football really is the is the the glue which knits sporting people in england together so the national team what the national team does is of vital importance 2016 uh, going out to iceland in your experience now at this level of your career and as far as you've gotten and the lows you'd experienced with other clubs were you prepared for the parting that you had with England and, and how did it affect you afterwards when all was said and done? No, I was prepared for the parting because my contract was at an end. So that wasn't a problem, the actual parting. I, I realised that to, to, to get uh, an extension of the contract, we would have to do well in the, in the Euros and get at least further uh, to the, to the quarter-final where we'd have met, met, met France. We had to get that far if, you know, my tenure was going to even be considered mm -hmm. in terms of being prolonged. So I was prepared to leave, absolutely. But it was a sad way to leave because it was such a, such a, a poor and disappointing performance against a team that really, nine times out of ten, we could and should have beaten. It came as a bit of a shock, I think, to us all. Yeah. Right. Crystal Palace. We've got this as 2017 onwards, and although there were yeah. other forays in there too, going back to your boyhood club and, and managing there, what was that like? 
yeah, it was a massive <laughs> surprise, to, to, to be honest. But again, a bit like the England England job, it was one of those offers when it came that, that I was very proud to to get. And uh, it's been a very happy period of time in terms of the relationship I've been able to build up with the, the chairman, the sporting director, and with the, the groups of players, you know, the, the players in for the first four years, if you like, you know, there were changes, but it was a very solid core. But the one thing I will say is that in the whole of that time, the way the club's been run, the way the club operates, and the groups of players that I've been given to work with, they've been absolutely first class. And I will always take that with me uh, when my time at Crystal Palace finishes, that it's been, been a wonderful experience to work with them during this long period of time. What do the players give you, do you think? Players give me energy. They, they give me the 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 full the, the drugs, I suppose, that one needs if you, you've been in football a long time and you you know you you still enjoy being in football. They give you that. They give you the camaraderie, and most importantly of all, I think what they what they give you is is the feeling that you're still capable of maybe doing something worthwhile in terms of what you can offer them, even though, of course, you know uh, that is going to diminish as the years go on because your your physical ability to do it uh, diminishes. What do you think it is now that, that you have improved so much on as a, as a coach and as a manager? I think leadership skills have been better. I think probably a bit better at um, trying to imagine what it's like for the person that I, I'm dealing with, a bit, a bit less uh, blinkered, if you like, in, in the approach, a little, a little bit more uh, malleable perhaps as well you know it's uh, a bit more gray comes into your life you get older the black and white softens and the gray areas expand slightly but I, I don't know necessarily that the people that I work with in those early days would come and see the way I am today and the way I work today and and see a vast difference mm -hmm. but I hope they would see some difference and I hope they would they would see aspects of what I do today and and say well you know, you were a bit harsher, a bit more blinkered than that when you worked with us years ago. But um, I don't know that I've changed fundamentally. And I think the fundamental change with managers and coaches is when you, you get tired of it. You, 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 you become more cynical. You get a bit tired of it. You, you lose a bit of the enthusiasm. You lose some of your energy. You, you don't look forward to going in to work because it's cold and it's windy and you've got a couple of problems with one or two players. And that starts to change the way you see the whole, the whole gamut, if you like, of your, of your job and your approach to football. I'm fortunate, I think, that I've been able to stave that off for the best part, and I suppose that has given me the longevity that I never really sought. I never, I never started off at the age of 29 thinking I'd be working at the age of 76. Before we let you go, um, it's not just those achievements. The, there are so many other achievements in, in your career that we couldn't let you go without talking about. The, the CBE in 2021 uh, that you picked up at, at the Palace, how special was that for you? Well, it's very special because it's a, it's a recognition. I think all recognition that you get for, for your part in football, you know, football is a, an important aspect of people's lives. I'm not, listen, it's, it's, not, it's not brain surgery and it, it's not top scientific work. It's, it's not even as good a work as our nurses are doing in the NHS. So it needs to be put in its proper compartment. But it is important to a lot of people. Football, football you know, does play a part in a lot of people's lives. So when, you know, you get that letter saying, we think you've done a, a good job for football and you've represented your chosen profession well and we'd like to give you an honour, you've got to be very, very proud of that, very happy to get it. And it was nice to receive it at the Palace also from, from the Prince of Wales, Prince William, whom of course I worked with for four years with the national team. Roy, it has been an absolute honour and we're going to give you this book, we've got thank a lovely box much. that you can put it in well, and uh, nice. there'll be thank a couple you. more chapters still to come I imagine as well. So thank you, that was a real pleasure Roy, thank you very well, much. Thank you very much indeed, thanks, thanks, thanks thank for you. the show. Good, well thanks for the book, it's very nice. <laughs> I remember the faces now. <laughs>